I'd like to go back this morning to Genesis to continue uh, with our observations concerning Abraham. Uh, and we hope and pray that the Lord would give us the connection of the example that is given. In chapter 17, the Lord appears unto Abraham again, this time after he has changed his name. And in verse 15 it says, And God said unto Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah her name shall be, and I will bless her. And I will give you a son also of her, and I will bless her, and she shall be called the mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. And Abraham fell on his face, and he laughed, and he said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old? And shall Sarah, that is ninety years old, bear? And Abraham said unto God, O oh, that Ishmael may live before you. We cannot exhaust the extensive demonstration that God gave this man, and I don't say it in any kind of criticism whatsoever. This is an example left for us. But we could not exhaust the constant manifestations that God gave to this man of his presence, of his mercy, of his sovereignty. And we could go back and we could trace again what we attempted to speak on last week. And my punitive cognitive, cognitive abilities say to me, it is absolutely amazing that a man would be called first of God. How did he receive this? In a dream. How did he know the dream was real? How did he know which way to go? I mean, the Ur of the Chaldeans, which, by the way, and we'll get to this in a minute, has a very wonderful meaning. But I mean, when he left his father's house and walked down the driveway, was there a signpost? Go this way? This way to the inheritance? This way to the promised land? He went out and God led him. Every step of the way. Not one step was improper. And he didn't make the the wrong turn to end up in some other land. There's no indication how long it was that it took him to make this journey, but let us consider something else. He was 75 years old. 75 years old, if the Lord grant any of us that age, is not the time to be thinking I'm going to pack up and go out, not knowing where I'm going, having no provisions made for me, no reservations, and I'm just going to Go for a little walkabout. But God dealt with him. And showed him that the will of God has nothing to do with the ability of the flesh. As Zechariah tells us, it is not by might nor by strength, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. The scripture has given us many names of people and places. The scripture is given by the inspiration of the breath of God. We can listen to the arguments of those who want to banter back and forth about what was inspired, how was it inspired, how was it written, what was lost in the translation. And when the focus is put on that kind of concern, 
and praise and worship is given to this book, we'll find that there is a great preponderance to start getting into arguments over fables, endless genealogies, arguments about jots and tittles and the law, and things of that nature. The testimony that God has given to his people is personal. It is the spirit of God with the spirit of the child within. Are they different? Not in the least bit. Therefore, the testimony is not different. There's no whisper down the lane. There's no loss in the translation. There's no questioning about semantics, wondering what did you really mean by that. The Spirit of the Most High God bears witness with the Spirit of the Most High God that we are, if we be born from above, children of God. And if we are children of God, the inspiration of the Word of God is the testimony from faith to faith. Now, we have said this many times. We will ask the question continually. Can you prove faith? So where is it that we have to come up with proof? Adam wants proof. Adam is going to spend a great deal of time, and we have this in our religious worlds today, the religious societies, we have a great number of people who pride themselves in understanding the ancient Hebrew text. And they can tell you how to pronounce all these words. And they can tell you where all these things were, and they know the histories and all these different nuances, and they can tell you all kinds of wonderful facts. And yeah, I find it interesting. But that's not what the scripture was given for. Those things that were written aforetime are written for our learning that through the comfort of the scriptures we might have hope which cannot be seen or proven. The scripture becomes the testimony of confirmation. This is how you've been taught of the spirit. Here's the confirmation of it. And the confirmation is not left up to Someone who might stand in a long robe or someone who might stand in a gray shirt and tell you this is what it means. The scripture is not of private interpretation. The scripture is according to the principle that God himself has established. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Why does it say he created two things? Because in the mouth of two witnesses, all things shall be established. The heavens declare the glory of the Lord. The firmament shows forth his handiwork. The principle that God has established is that there will always be a confirmation. Nothing is hanging out there in the wind for people to look at and say, you know, I think that's very akin to this, or that's akin to that. Because as we have seen in anyone who has done any reading, we'll see that from generation to generation, these things change. As one person says, here's the fulfillment, here's the testimony, and the days go by, and it's proven to be false. God has established that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, everything should be established. He he came and he left a testimony for all the world to see. No one, even those who are deprived of the natural ability, no one is devoid of the testimony of the creation of God. You can say, well, nobody can see outside. Well, if they have a a corporal being, they have the testimony of the creation of God. For he has formed that vessel for them. How they perceive it is how they have been given to understand it. The names and the places where God has revealed the wondrous events of his will. Somebody might raise a hand and say, can you tell me what God's will is? Very simple. Whatsoever comes to pass is the will of God. Because he works all things after the counsel of his own will. No one can stop him. No one can stay his hand. He has said, as I have purposed, so I shall do it. My counsel shall stand. I call those things which are not as though they've already been. I've declared the end from the beginning. And there's nobody that can withstand me, oppose me, 
or hinder those things that I have decreed should come to pass. Now I know my mind is taken constantly in the fear of prospect of what might happen. I see a situation, I evaluate it, and I come to the conclusion that nothing good is going to come out of this. And with that, I want to busy myself as to fixing it, straightening it out. And that is Adam to a T. That is the epitome of the nature and understanding of Adam. Nothing good is going to come out of this. And that very phrase is an affront to the sovereignty of Almighty God who said, all things work together for good. To them that love him, to the call according to his purpose. Now here we have Abraham. Abraham has come forth and he's had the promise of God. Like I said, we're going to start back and we're going to say, he is living in the passion of the clodbreakers. Or the Chaldeans. Clodbreakers? Yes. You know those people that walk behind the horse that's plowing the field, breaking up the clods of dirt so you can plant the field? And they have such a zeal to do it. They have such a passion. And we look at that and say, what are they? Let's talk about vanity. How esteemed is the Ur of the Chaldeans? How great was that area of Mesopotamia? And Abraham was called out. Just as the Lord has said to his people, come out from among her. Be not partaker of her sin. Here they are, the Chaldeans. The passion, we have a job, we have a station in life. We go behind the horse and we break up the clods so we can plant the garden and we can eat our meat. God calls him out of that. There's nothing that says that Abraham was a clod breaker, but we can only assume. But 75 years old says, here's my promise. I'm going to make a great nation out of you. I'm going to give you a great name, and I'm going to give you a land. He goes on for a number of years, having problem after problem, encountering all of these difficulties, and He says to the Lord, uh, you know what? I don't have any kids. The Lord says, Abram, exalted father. Exalted father? I'm 75 years old. What do you mean exalted father? I don't have any children. I will give unto your seed. I will make your seed as the dust of the earth. So if a man could number the dust of the earth, thy seed also shall be numbered. Lord, wait a minute. Maybe you haven't gotten this. You want to see my my birth certificate? You want to see my driver's license? I'm 75 years old and I don't have any kids. Sarah comes to him and says, you know what? Got an idea for you. God says, no, that's not the intent. But, the person of nobility Sarai said to Abram, here's my servant. Her name name means to fly away. You know, she's disposable. Take her. Have a son. And when he does what she says, she's furious. And Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bare Ishmael to him. Lord, I know you gave me a promise, but at 86 years old, what do you think I'm going to do with this little kid running around? And when Abraham was 99 years old, can you imagine this? Now, I don't know how old Abram was 
when God came to him and said, get out of the earth of Chaldeans. But we know he was 75 when he left. 24 years later, God comes to him and says, I'm going to make my covenant with you and with your seed. And Sarah, Sarah, is no longer of nobility. She is the queen, Sarah. I know you know that's what you name Mary. Sarah, a woman of nobility, is going to have a son. I'm a hundred, I'm 99 years old, Lord. What do you expect me to do? You see, God didn't give Abram all of the information up front. And when he came and he said, Eleazar, he's my steward. God said, no, somebody born of your own bowels is being your heir. So you take Hagar, there's Abram's seed. Okay, it makes sense. No, Sarah is going to bear you a son, a child of promise. Now you hear Abraham say, not only do we have his name changed, but now you hear Abraham say, Lord, I'm a hundred years old. She's ninety. What do you expect? Do you hear the question of the disciples? Lord, who then can be saved? And the answer is identical. With man it is impossible. But the Lord says unto Abraham, listen, Now, know very well, and with all our technology today, and no apologies to our medical profession, man still doesn't know how the seed and the egg come together. They see it happen, but they can't tell you this one and this one shall come together. They don't know how the bones are formed together in the womb. They don't know when a child is born with a congenital defect, how that happened. Oh, there's a lot of reasons that they accuse it of. But it is only the Lord God Almighty who prepares each and every earthen vessel explicitly to the precise qualifications that he has designed them. So we think about that because it says in chapter 17, verse 21, But my covenant will I establish with Isaac... Wait a minute. Who's Isaac? They haven't had a child yet. She hasn't even conceived yet. And his name is already stated. Gee, Abram was the exalted father, a name given unto him for his station in life. Now, nah, you people are being really, really tough here. The station in life? Yes, that's what his father's name is. Tara men. The station in life was the exalted father. Yes, we can say Tara had great expectations for his firstborn son, that he would have children and he would have a great nation. Maybe that's why he named his secondborn son Snoring, Nechor. And he named his third son Haran, the mountaineer, but I guarantee you this, he had never, he had no idea that the mountaineer would die before his father not having any children. You see, we can make all the plans and speculations that we want. We can say, look, here, his son is born. He's going to be great. Look at this. He's going to do this, that, and the other thing. I'm going to send him to school. I'm going to teach him this. We have no guarantees. But the station that was assigned to this earthen vessel was that of an exalted father. And at a hundred years old, God said to him, I will establish my covenant with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto you at this set time in the next year. Wow. This is the God that our friends want to tell us doesn't care about little things. Isaac shall be born unto you and Sarah at a set time this year.
And Sarah laughed. God returned unto them the way of youth. He returned unto Sarah the way of the woman. And what happens? Well, Abraham goes down and he meets up with Abimelech. And it worked once. Sarah, tell him you're my sister. You know? So that he doesn't kill me and we don't have any problems here. And Abimelech takes her. And he wants to make her his wife. I know that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. But what do you think made Abimelech concerned about a 90-year-old woman? God returned unto her the way of woman. Made her attractive. And Abimelech had not yet come near unto her. And the Lord said, and said unto the Lord, Will you slay also a righteous nation? Because God gave Abimelech in a dream and says, That's another man's wife. Abimelech went to uh, the Lord and he said, uh, she, he, he said, that was his sister. And, and she said, he was her brother. You know, I'm innocent here. Yea, I know that you did this in the integrity of your heart. For I also withheld you from sinning against me. Chapter 20, verse 6. I prevented you from sinning. You remember? This is the God who our friends want to tell us is not the author of sin. Has nothing to do with sin. I prevented you. David cried, Lord, keep me from the secret sins that I don't even know about. Which goes to the very nature of Adam. Now therefore, restore the man his wife. For he is a prophet, and he shall pray for you. You shall live. But if you don't restore her, Know that you shall surely die, you, and that all that are with you. Lord, I, I, I'm, I'm, I hear what you're saying, and uh, I'm going to do what, you, what you're telling me to do, but i got a real problem here. If he's a prophet, why does he act this way? He lied to me. He prostituted his wife. How can this be a prophet? Isn't the prophet the one who's supposed to be walking around with the icon of the halo over his head because he has the word of God? Isn't he the one who's above everybody because he has been given all these things? But what did James tell us concerning the prophets? Take, for example, the prophets who had the word, who were obedient unto God and suffered great things. They had no certain dwelling place. They were vagabonds. They were sojourners. They were wanderers. You see, the world's got a very different idea about all these wonderful religious people who have the word of God to share with everybody. Here is the example of a prophet. And you can understand why this man says, could be saying, a prophet? But he does what he should do. And Abraham prayed unto God, and God healed Abimelech and his wife and his handmaid and his maidservants that they bare children. For the Lord had closed up all the wounds of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. That's right. Man does not know how the seed comes together in the womb and how the bones are formed. Because Almighty God is the one who dictates the time of habitation and the limitations thereof. And he demanded that because of Abraham's 
deceit, Sarah's lie, and the fear that existed in these two individuals, the entire nation was not having any children. Now, was this something that happened overnight? How long does this thing with Abimelech take? That the entire nation is not bearing children. Once again, we come back to a time factor that really is not something that that is considered. I mean, he restores Sarah to Abraham. Abraham prays for him, and his wife gives birth. I don't think it works that way. I think they still had to go through the natural process of how long it took for the birth to happen. And then we come to chapter 21. And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said. Have I not spoken? Shall it not come to pass? The testimony of the word of God being true is the fact that it has come to pass. Not that there's speculation as to when it shall come to pass, because our Lord came to fulfill all things written by the law and the prophets. And when he said it was finished, he meant it was finished. And all things have been fulfilled. So as God has said, so he has done. He visited Sarah at the set time, That he said he would in that year. Sarah conceived, bare Abraham a son, in his old age, at the set time of which God had spoken unto him. And Abraham and Sarah sat down and took out the baby books to try and figure out what his name should be. This is all the beautiful demonstration of the sovereignty of God over his creation for his beloved. Here we have two individuals born from above, having that precious incorruptible seed within, who were battling against, in warfare against, the corruption of the flesh. Was Abraham, sure, I have to go back, was Abram, A child of grace because he believed? No. He was a child of grace and he believed. And he believed because of righteousness, the imputed righteousness. Did Sarah fail to have children because she didn't have enough faith? Is the hand of God withheld because of something that I can do or something that I can't do? If the hand of God is withheld because of things that I can't do, the hand of God is completely incompetent and impotent because there is nothing I can do. For without Him, you can do nothing. In Him we live and move and have our being. He has set the times of our habitations and the limitations thereof. I could not have been born one second earlier and I shall not die one second later than what He has decreed. They called his name Isaac. And Sarah said, God has made me laugh so that all that here will laugh with me. She was rebuked of God for laughing. Now all will laugh with her. Abraham, Abram, was the exalted father whose name was changed to the exalted father of many, having no tangible proof or evidence that this would ever come to pass. But he stands as a type. And the type we find in Isaiah chapter 9, where we read concerning a child that is born, and a son that is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name is called the Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting, the Eternal Father, the Prince of Peace.
The station in life for Abram was the exalted father because his seed was in him. He had to wait a hundred years for it to be manifested, but that didn't change the fact the seed was in him. Here, 500 years before Jesus was born in Bethlehem, we have a statement that goes back the annals of time to before the foundation of the world, because he says, for unto us the child is already born, and the son is already given, and his name is the eternal father, having his seed in him. Isn't that the way God created man in the garden? Having his seed in him? Was that not the image of God that he created them? Male and female created he them? The eternal father is the son that is given having the seed within him. And before the seed was manifest, the seed had a name. Not the name that you and I have given each other. That is our name in Adam. But there is a name which no man knows. For the Lord of hosts numbers the stars of the heaven and calls them by name. And did he not tell Abraham, your children shall be as the stars of heaven? Now many want to say that that's the nation of Israel. But his name was changed from Abram to Abramhim which is the father of many nations, showing that the children of the faithful, the, son, the father of the faithful, are unto every kindred, every nation, every tribe, and every tongue. He is the wonderful counselor, <clears throat> because as we have said before, he works all things according to the counsel of his own will. And that will is not something that's out on a plaque that you can pick it up and read like the horoscopes. What is today's God's will for today? But everything comes to pass according to that will. So the secret counselor is the one who is causing all things that he has created for his good pleasure, because his desire is upon his beloved to work together in complete harmony for the good of the beloved. And he is the mighty God. The son is the mighty God. The child is the mighty God. The mighty God, the eternal father, made himself of no reputation, took on the form of the servant, the elect servant who came as the Son to do the will of the Father, and all that the Father gave unto him, all the works that he did is what the Father showed me, all the words that I have spoken is the words that the Father has given unto me, and all that the Father has given to me, I have lost none, but I have raised them up in the last day. How else could it work but complete harmony? These things were finished when John saw the Lamb standing as though he had been slain from the foundation of the world. That blood had been shed for the inability of Adam that had not yet been formed in the dust of the earth. That blood was shed to be struck upon the tabernacle, the earthen tabernacle, where the dwelling would be for the child of grace. That was shed so that the leaven within the tabernacle could be cleansed out, that the seed be not corrupt. By coming or polluted by coming in contact with a dead body. For the body is dead because of sin. These things were all finished. Therefore the child is born. The son is given. He is the mysterious or the secret counselor. He is the mighty God who has all power over all flesh. Who sits in the heavens and rules over the kingdoms of this world. And does whatsoever his heart has intended. And none can stay his hand, for he is the Lord God omnipotent and reigns. And true and righteous are all his judgments and all of his ways. And he is the eternal father. He says in the testimony, the, the prophet says, who shall declare his generation? You remember what John said when he was given the revelation? He said, I saw the redeemed of the Lord 
12,000 from the 12 tribes, 144,000. Then I saw a host which no man could number of every kindred, every tribe, every nation, and every tongue. And they sang a new song unto him, saying, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. The Lamb has finished this work. The mighty God has formed all things and completed them by the power of his will. And the Eternal Father has declared his generation. And how does he declare it? In Isaiah chapter 8, we read that he has come forth and he has said, Behold, I and the children which thou hast given to me for signs and wonders unto Israel. He declared his generation. He declared his generation before the throne, before the Father, because he is the Father. And he said, look, this is the seed, the incorruptible seed. They are separated, set apart in the anointed salvation of Jehovah. They are preserved in the anointed salvation of Jehovah. And nothing can separate them from the eternal love of the Father. He has said, he has appeared unto me of old. Yea, I have loved you with an eternal love. And his children love him because he first loved them. And they love each other because they are of the family. He's built his temple. He has raised up his temple. He is seated upon the throne. And he rules as king and as prince and as priest. Zechariah tells us that there is something that happens here. There is something that exists concerning this situation. He said, I looked. And here was the branch. He shall grow up out of his place. He shall build the temple of Jehovah. I know this is a commercial. I know this is a sidebar. You've heard it so many times before. But if the scripture tells me that he's going to build the temple of the, of Jehovah, what do we need with the hands of man trying to build some structure over in the Middle East? Jesus looked at the, at the Pharisees. He said, tear this temple down in three days. I'll build it up again. He didn't speak of the mortar and stones about him. He spoke of his body. He shall build the temple, the body of Jehovah. Even he shall build the temple of Jehovah and he shall bear the glory. Father, I finished all the work you have given me. Glorify me now with the glory we had before the foundation of the world. I've given your word unto your people that they may be one as we are one. And shall sit And rule upon his throne. That's exactly what Nebuchadnezzar saw. That's exactly what we are told. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. Ruling over all things. And he shall be priest upon his throne. And the council of peace. Shall shall be between them both. Because we have a finished work. Wherein he fulfilled the law in all righteousness, being justified by his faith, we have peace because his name is the Prince of Peace. These things are done. These things are finished. And we, like Abram and Abraham and Sarah, are going to spend whatever time the Lord has given us to try and facilitate his will in the best way these little things can understand it. He's going to show us his marvelous works as he gives us the testimony that my will is done in heaven and in earth. This is the blessing 
of the Lord God Almighty. This is the testimony of the Spirit with our spirit. And here is the example set forth in the Scriptures that we might have comfort, that we might learn. Yeah, you know, at 75, it's going to be kind of hard to get up and move. And at 86, I, I, got, I got a little baby on my hand. At 99, you're telling me I'm going to have a child. And it doesn't end there. Sarah was 127 years old when she passed away. Abraham was well stricken in age. And Abraham took a wife. Are you kidding me? No. He took a wife and she bears Zimran, Jokshan, Medan, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. Can you explain that? No, you can't explain it. Except for the fact that it was the creed of God necessary that these individuals be born. You say, the man's 128 years old when Sarah dies, and then he's well stricken in years, and he has these children, what good could that come out of that? Well, just as a preview, we'll say this. You know that individual named Joseph that had the fancy coat? Had a dream given unto him by God? Got all his brothers mad at him? Got his father mad at him? His father said, what are your brothers doing? He said, I don't know. He said, go find out. They took him. They threw him in a ditch. Said, let's kill him. But Judah said, so he was the, uh, he was the investment officer. He said, wait, 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 isn't there a profit we can have here? And isn't it interesting that the Midianites bought Joseph and gave him a lift down to Egypt. Was it important? Yes, it was. All things. He said, what about Lot? And his little hiatus in Sodom and Gomorrah. We're not here to sit and say all these things are wonderful and good and applaud him for being involved in the licentious nature of that community. But Lot was separated from Adam. Lot was separated from his wife. Lot was incestuously joined to his daughter, who named her son, her son of the father. Can you imagine going through school with a name like that? And your brother's name is of the tribe. Let's put them together. Of the tribe of my father. Strange people. But in Moab... There was a seed named Ruth. And Ruth was a friend of God's. She was redeemed by Boaz. And she was the great grandmother of King David. Nothing happens by chance. We may look at things. Strike that word. We do look at things. And say, oh Lord, this can't be happening. Surely this is not correct. The testimony of the scripture left to us is that I have decreed all things necessary as my will is performed and as I demonstrate that I indeed am the great king over all the earth. The Lord God who sits and rules over the heavens considering the inhabitants of this world as a winged infestation and giving the kingdoms of this world unto the basest of the men and putting it in their heart to fulfill his will. That's a tough one. We can look at the different seats of government from local all the way up to wherever you want to stop. 
and say, how could that individual be doing the will of God? Because there's none who can resist his will. Could Abram, Abram say, Lord, 75, I just got my Medicare card. I'd have to change my address. I'm not leaving here. You know, this, this, this is my life. Lord, you told me a kid. I'm 86. Here's a kid. Isn't that enough? He makes his people willing in the day of his power. For it is he that works in you both to will and to do. Everyone, everyone performs those things assigned unto them willingly. For it is God who causes us to do the things that he has decreed and to fulfill his word. Is it time to pat myself on the back saying, hey, I'm keeping the will of God. Abraham got himself in some some really tight spots. He came out of Egypt wealthy in cattle and gold and silver. He came away from Abimelech with sheep and oxen, maidservants and manservants. Is that the answer that we hear today in the religious world? Or do we hear how you have conditions that have to be made in order for God to bless you? Are we condoning the actions in front of Pharaoh and the actions in front of Abimelech? Not in the least bit. But we explain it. God is not persuaded by my actions, nor is he a respecter of my person. He has established my time. He has set me on a path. He has given me assignment. He causes me to walk in the path that I have walked, because the way of man is not in himself. It is not of him that walks to direct his steps. And he brings to pass whatsoever he has decreed for this individual to do by the power of his own will. And in that will is the demonstration of how wretched a man I am, how vile I am, and how weak I am. So that we know, like Zechariah tells us, it is not by might, it is not by power. The race is not to the swift, The victory is not unto the mighty. It is by the grace of God. We praise his name because of that grace. They brought forth the headstone and they cried, grace, grace unto it. I pray the Lord will give us understanding of these things in spite of my rambling and that he will instruct us in the peace that is beyond all understanding. It's easy to see when you look at the things, especially here with Abram, Abram, how it doesn't make any sense. Completely contrary to nature. And the testimony of the scripture is continual. That the children of grace walk by faith, not by sight. You want to prove it? That's Adam. Walk by faith. It's something you can't prove. And Lord, give us understanding. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your testimony that you have left to us. We pray the testimony be a confirmation of the word you have given us by your spirit. We know, Lord, that our abilities in Adam cannot understand the wonders that you have done We cannot understand the great love that you have for your people. We confess unto your Lord that we constantly look to revise, augment, and correct those things which we perceive as being unpleasant, improper. 
and not according to our liking. We know, Lord, that you are indeed the great king. We know that you are in control of everything. We praise your name for these things, and we confess our inabilities and our faults before you. May the Spirit give us comfort. May the Spirit give us understanding. For it's in your name we pray. Amen.